Queridos amigos, hoy tenemos una actividad interesantísima en la academia y además eh, novedosa, como es la presentación del documental El Reporte Allen, un recorrido por el metodismo africano transnacional de la su guionista, productora, directora y, y todo lo que hay que hacer para hacer un documental, la licenciada Alana Lockwood. Le damos la más cordial bienvenida a los académicos de número, correspondientes, amigos que siempre nos acompañan en estas actividades en la academia. El presentador del documental lo será el doctor Bramo Yapons, miembro de número y expresidente de la Academia Dominicana de la Historia, quien me ha pedido con su habitual modestia que no diga nada acerca de su currículum, sino que simplemente lo invite a pasar por acá para presentarnos esta obra de la licenciada Alana Lomar. Muchas gracias, don Adrián. Queridos académicos, queridos amigos, esta va a ser la presentación más corta que ustedes habrán de escuchar o han escuchado en la Academia Dominicana de la Historia, porque realmente esta noche lo que vale es el filme, eh, y esto es como, como presentar un concierto o una sinfonía, ¿qué puede uno decir si no vamos a escuchar la música? que es realmente el mensaje que nos trae esta noche a Lana Lowell. Pero desde luego, ella me pidió que diga algunas palabras, que las voy a decir, eh, mencionando en primer lugar que Alana tiene merecidos méritos y también gran justificación en haber producido, eh, por haber producido este, este documental porque aunque el conocimiento no se hereda, pero sí se hereda y se absorbe la cultura familiar. Alana es hija de Alfonso Lockhart y es nieta de Georgie Lockhart Stammer. Georgie Lockhart, como ustedes saben, es el autor de la única historia del protestantismo en la República Dominicana, un libro que debería ser reeditado junto con este otro que es prácticamente desconocido, las cartas de Cardi, primer misionero metodista en Samaná, que es también el segundo misionero metodista en la isla, porque antes de Cardi hubo uno en, 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 en la parte occidental de la isla durante la dominación haitiana. La importancia del metodismo eh, a, en, en la República Dominicana ha sido... Eh, escasamente estudiada no es sino hasta la aparición de este film y la publicación por la Academia Dominicana de la Historia de la tesis doctoral de Denis Hidalgo eh, sobre ¿cómo es que se llama la tesis de Denis Hidalgo? la inmigración de, de, sí, de, de libertos norteamericanos a Santo Domingo es eh, bueno, ustedes deben saber que a finales del siglo XVIII eh, prevalecían en, 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 en los recién nacidos Estados Unidos dos tendencias protestantes, habían otras o evangélicas, los bautistas y los metodistas, que tenían mucho interés en, en abolir la esclavitud. Eh, había un movimiento abolicionista muy fuerte, muy a finales del siglo XVIII, que realmente lideraban los cuáqueros, pero los bautistas, hubo iglesias bautistas y metodistas en determinados estados, sobre todo en el norte, que se oponían francamente a la esclavitud. Los, y enviaron misiones al Caribe, a las colonias inglesas. Los bautistas se ocupaban por enseñar el Evangelio a los esclavos, pero los metodistas se, eh, preferían trabajar con, con, los, eh, con los libertos. Y eso, justamente, cuando el, 
viene una crisis que va a ser explicada por, en, en el filme en 1780, 1794 cuando Richard Allen se separa porque un grupo de religiosos como él había, se habían sentado por equivocación en la parte que le correspondía a los blancos en la iglesia le pidieron que se levantaran de ahí, que se fueran, aquello fue produciendo un sismo. Y finalmente en 1816, él ya creó el, la iglesia metodista eh, africana junto con una serie de colaboradores y seguidores. Esta, este video cuenta en una parte muy importante eh, la contribución de Richard Allen al, al, a la difusión de, de las ideas y de las misiones metodistas, no solamente en, donde, en, en, en Norteamérica, sino también en África. Y algo que no había sido debidamente destacado, que es lo que hace Alana Loco, en, en el Caribe. Eh, Richard Allen eh, tuvo una participación directa eh, apoyando la inmigración de libertos norteamericanos sobre todo de los, de, los, de los puertos de Filadelfia y Baltimore, a la isla de Santo Domingo. Ustedes recuerdan que entre 1824 y 1826 el presidente de Haití, Jean Pierre Weyer, eh, se puso en contacto con la llamada eh, Sociedad Americana de Colonización, con sus dos líderes, el señor Loring, el señor, eh, Loring Dewey y el señor... Um, Jonathan Granville y eh, en, en base a un acuerdo ustedes todos saben muy bien vinieron a la, a la isla de, de Santo Domingo, en ese momento llamada la isla de Haití, entre 4 y 6 mil libertos una gran parte de los cuales regresó a Estados Unidos porque no había condiciones, otra parte murió, pero un grupo pequeño se quedó en Samaná entre Samaná y Puerto Plata y justamente ahí el, el, el viene lo interesante de la historia, porque este ministro metodista dejó Puerto Plata, las comunidades de Puerto Plata, que era en ese momento una población, eh, vamos a decir, dentro de las precariedades de la isla, bastante civilizada, y se fue a un lugar bastante primitivo como era la aldea de Samaná para atender a los libertos que se quedaron allí. El, el, este, este filme lo hizo Alana eh, eh, con la estructura de un documental para explicar la función y el impacto de la iglesia metodista africana eh, eh, y entrevistó eh, 19 personas ¿verdad? en tres idiomas en Namibia en, en, en Estados Unidos en Haití y, y, y aquí en, en, en la República Dominicana de manera que nosotros vamos a ver algo que realmente nos va a sorprender por los testimonios y por lo que eh, le podríamos llamar la supervivencia de una conciencia africana dentro del metodismo eh, este, este filme si, si, si Alana me permite que lo diga es parte de sus esfuerzos que ella es como un Sería llamarle un subproducto de tu tesis doctoral sobre la difusión de los principios de la Iglesia Metodista Africana, que se conoce también como African Methodist Episcopal Church, la AMI, ¿no? No es así. Así que, como les dije, no voy a hablar mucho más del filme, habla por sí mismo. El filme, debo decir, eh, que además de lo interesantísimo que es, por lo, por lo mucho que nos enseña. Tiene un solo momento, Alana, que yo tengo que decirlo, que me inquieta mucho, y es que eh, ustedes van a ver que todas las entrevistas son de gente eh, razonable, eh, que está haciendo un esfuerzo de memoria, pero hay un personaje que es todo un señor activista, eh, que presenta sus ideas con un radicalismo que a uno le llama la atención, pero que realmente son la expresión de un eh, resentimiento latente, heredado, atávico, que viene justamente de la conciencia y la, y la conservación de la memoria de lo que fue 
el maltrato a los esclavos en las, en, en, en las sociedades esclavistas de Norteamérica y, de, y del Caribe. Bueno, el firme hablará por sí mismo, así que muchas gracias por su atención. A ti muchas gracias, Alana, por pedirme su atención. Permítanme presentarle ahora a la directora y realizadora de, esta, de este documental. Alana Lockwer tiene un diplomado en pedagogía dancística de la Royal Academy of Dancing de México, una licenciatura en ciencias de la comunicación de la Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana Xochimilco de México, una maestría en arte en contexto de la Universidad de Kunste en Berlín, un diplomado en gerencia cultural de la Academia Alemana de Administración en Berlín y un diplomado en pedagogía universitaria por la Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra. Es profesora en esta universidad, ha sido editora cultural del Listín Diario, periodista de investigación de la desaparecida revista Rumbo, columnista del Nuevo Herald de Miami, y tiene una extraordinariamente vasta labor como curadora de numerosas eh, exposiciones artísticas en varios continentes. Así es que los invito ahora a que veamos el reporte Allen, un recorrido por el metodismo africano transnacional de Alan Alonso. within the Black Atlantic, uh, he's able to, to mobilize it in a way. church would have started before the AME church because way back in 1922 came the spirit of Marcus Garvey. He would have come with a ship in Wallfish Bay to show that this is Marcus Garvey who wanted to have African for the Africans. The Africans would develop themselves, start their own churches if you like start their own thing and come away from the whites. So this is the time that the Hereros felt they wanted to come out of the Lutheran Church or the then Rhinish Missionary Church. Christians, because these missionaries came here 
and saw only the evil, the non-Christianity of the of the uh, blacks and the rose for that matter. So they made the people Christians by force. And then came the war. And even during the war, the starting of the war, they were invited to a church in specific Eto Chimbiwe. Where they were told, now praise your, close your eyes, we are going to pray. And when they closed their eyes for prayer, they were shot. Therefore, after the war, they couldn't see how they could still be with this church how they could still be Christians for that matter. But then again, they were driven into areas where there were no waters, no food, no nothing. They were annihilated, as we all know. And those who lived, the few that lived, were hiding in the field until a certain Dr. H. Feta collected them. Him, having been a pastor as well, he started to make them and bring them to Christianity. And they started to come back to Christianity for the sake of surviving, not for the sake of conviction. And when the spirit of God came, after the Germans lost the war, and now there was the wise, the South Africans, with their Odendal plan and so on, came the spirit of Gavi. And this one wake up the chief ten ships of the Hereros. Yes, why can we not stand up for ourselves? Why can we not start with our own church? Although some Herero pastors were educated, they could not be in the leadership positions. The collection in the church were sent to Germany, collected from poor black people here, and sent to Germany to save the Germans over there. These are some of the things people started to say. While they were going on like this, the AME church was started. One such guy who played a crucial role in the formation of the AME church, beside uh, Marcus um, Vidboe, was a certain Herero gentleman by the name of Jonas Kacherungu. He was from the south. He too came to Karepep during those days as an interpreter in the, in the magistrate court. And he helped very much also for the Herero people now to start their own church, being helped by the AME church. They even wanted to have some of their own Hereros to be sent to the AMG. AME to be educated as as, 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 as pastors. The African Methodist Episcopal Church is is the largest and oldest of the black Methodist bodies. And it alone among the black Methodist denominations, and even among the other black Protestant denominations, has had the longest and the broadest reach across the transatlantic in terms of touching persons of African descent, not only in the United States, but in the Caribbean, in South America, in Europe, in Africa. It would be just as easy to for, for persons living in Charleston to want to have contacts, slave or free, in Philadelphia as much as in Barbados and Jamaica or in after, after the turn of the 19th century in Sierra Leone and Liberia. And keep in mind, uh, London has a significant black population. And so there are African Americans who go back, who, who, who leave uh, the North American mainland from Canada, from Nova Scotia, and go to London, and then from London to Sierra Leone. There are too few scholars, although it's changing now, 
with the, with the rise of Atlantic world studies, but there, there were too few scholars who think about the African American experience, and I mean that hemispherically as a black Atlantic phenomenon, and, and, and not um, understanding that one should not look at geographical and national boundaries or demarcations as somehow affecting the way in which black people thought of themselves as persons in the diaspora. As I said, blacks saw, uh, saw themselves not only as, as engaging kinship with blacks uh, in Philadelphia and Baltimore and Boston, but, as, but also with their uh, um, compatriots in, in, in Haiti and Barbados and, and, and Brazil and, and, and so forth that there are even fewer scholars who've thought about the AME Church in a black Atlantic world context. Traditionally, we think about the AME Church established in the United States and it has foreign missions. Forgetting that that's not how AMEs envisage themselves. AMEs envisage themselves as living in the United States and having brothers and sisters elsewhere in the Caribbean, in South America, and in Africa. And it was the mission of the AME Church to bring all of these persons together. And so it always had, from Richard Allen forward, this, this black Atlantic consciousness. As I said, Richard, the, uh, the, uh, the first man elected a bishop in the AME Church, Daniel Coker, goes to Sierra Leone and establishes the West African Methodist Church. I mean, that, that alone is, is an indication of that kind of consciousness. Richard Allen himself sent Scipio Bean into Haiti. He would send, he sent Scipio Bean into Haiti in 1824, the same way that he sent people to New York or Pittsburgh. I mean, there was no, well, what's the difference between Pittsburgh and Haiti? We're all the same people. That's how Richard Allen envisaged that. himself did not draw this particular connection. He drew upon this, 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 this very deep heritage of, of black Atlantic interests in Africa, in Africa as a symbol ultimately of black freedom. And so I mean, he, 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 he doesn't introduce this term that there is a connection within the black Atlantic. Uh, he's able to, to mobilize it in a way that his predecessors could not because he was able to tap into newly urbanized blacks, particularly in the United States. It's very, very difficult to organize those kinds of pan-African movements when populations are dispersed in rural areas. But once they come to the city, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, and so forth and so on, it's a lot easier to organize people because the networks and communications are a lot uh, it are, are more easily facilitated in those kinds of settings. So that, that, that's the innovation that the Garvey movement brings. But the, but the idea that there is that there was a tie among persons of color within the Black Atlantic, obviously that's not new to Garvey. Well, there were a number of AME preachers who, who became uh, advocates of the Garvey movement. In fact, there was one woman uh, who was a... Uh, uh, missionary in the AME Church, her name was Emily Kinch, K-I-N-C-H. As I said, she was in New Jersey, and she was a very active and avid supporter of Marcus Garvey, and saw, and she had been to Africa uh, uh, working uh, with AME churches, and she saw a connection between the AME Church and what Garvey was trying to achieve. Keep in mind, by this time, the AME Church had been in Africa for a hundred years. I had a grandmother who was in the concentration camps with her firstborn daughter. She was more or less six, seven, and eight, perhaps up to nine. Her father was a white, one of the white officers. My grandmother was raped before the war. So when the war started, she has to run with her little one, who was white, but a very tallish girl, 
almost in a concentration camp, they almost raped her again. And this tall girl stood up towards the German soldier. And she fought him and get him off her mother. She overpowered him. And to his shame, the other soldiers were laughing. He got angry and stabbed my aunt while she was only a young girl. Into her hand, she died with a hand like this. She, she was stabbed by the bayonet of the rifle. And they told me very much about their ordeals in the concentration camp. They told me very much of people being hanged from the trees at Karapak. There was a house that they used to call the house of the tree. Apparently there was a tree where they were hanging people. An uncle of my grandmother was also beheaded. And that put me in the position to want to go. Maybe one of the scars that we brought back is, is, is my great uncle. as I went to school in Germany, uh, this was not taught to us in the history books or through the school books. We had many 
chapters and, 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 and classes about the genocide, the Shoah, meaning the European Holocaust against the Jews, but the Holocaust and the Shoah, or the, the genocide uh, done in Namibia by German administration was not taught to us in school. It's not surprising that out of these strong anti-colonial movements, they can also black resistant churches. So that is for the Herreras or Ruano, and for the Namas, the AME Church. We have a lot of German street names here, for example, from the former colonial power. You can say it's semantics, it's only street names and whatsoever, but we are lacking a Web Dubois Street, or a Marco Scarve Street, or Richard Allen Street. You can't understand any black that is part of the AME Church primary among them, apart from the fact that it, it here's an institution that's trying to live in a land of slavery, where, where even though property rights are asserted and are legalized, in Philadelphia, for example, uh, where there were lots of riots of whites against blacks, black property, black church property was never safe. Um, AME churches are in Ohio and Indiana, you know, in the, in the, in the frontier areas uh, that were that were set upon by by white moms, and uh, uh, in Cincinnati, in the race riot in the late 1820s in Cincinnati, the entire, almost the entire black population was uprooted, and uh, and, and the population and their churches and other community institutions were uprooted and, and, and taken to Canada. I mean, they were literally running for their lives. And so uh, that, I mean, they were aware that how, whatever they had in terms of legal property rights, that they were not always safe and not always secure. And so it's, one has to try to understand the domination in, in, in that context uh, as well. When the Civil War came, the, uh, and you have access to the Christian Reporter now, and, and it's, it's, by the way, the, AME, the, the Christian Reporter is the newspaper of record for the Civil War. There's no other black newspaper. If you want to know anything about blacks in the Civil War, you go to the Christian Reporter. Um, the church, there was no hesitation at all. Uh, the Civil War is upon us. Even before Lincoln proclaimed it, this is a war to, to get rid of slavery, and blacks ought to volunteer. And they allowed union, union recruiters into AME churches to recruit soldiers for the war. And what was interesting is that during the Civil War, there were four to five uh, AME preachers out of the 13 uh, who were chaplains. Henry Turner, David Stevens, William H. Hunter, um, uh, Garland White. Um, and because AMEs were among the first African Americans commissioned chaplaincy, yeah, this, the first person was Indian Turner, interestingly, in 1863. Uh, military chaplains have always had a special place in, in a military chaplains to this day are still automatically members of the, of the General Conference. And that dates from the Civil War because the church so highly esteemed these persons who served in war to overthrow slavery.
because Haiti itself is a new founded nation, a former slaves who are free, who earn their freedom to fight in. So it's a, you know, having all those history, all those black American former slaves that have to purchase their freedom. Here we did not purchase. Well, we had our freedom to blood, you know, to war. But they had to purchase and then finally make up, you know, churches to 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 take care of people and all those And I find that is a very peace, a very a great part of history. Most of the AM church that we had in the rural area. So we went way down, way, way in the bush, way back in those areas where evangelization does reach there. So we were there to preach, to teach the people there. So we, as my friend said, we are a trailblazer in that sense. Uh, there was a group of, of blacks in the 1870s in Poughkeepsie, New York, of all places, led by a man by the name of Abram Bolden, who decided that in New York they wanted to establish a black college. And, um, uh, and the name they chose for their college was Tucson College. And that wasn't unusual. I came across a document when the... Um, uh, when the Women's Parent Might Missionary Society of the AA Church was established in 1874. And when it was established, the person who wrote the preamble to their constitution and bylaws talked about that they were walking in the footsteps of two very important heroes of theirs, Richard Allen and Tucson Lupiture. They said that in 1874. They saw the two as, as two persons, one, one in America, one in Haiti, as being the progenitors, the foreparents of the black freedom movement. Just as I'm not surprised that the cover of your grandfather's book has a picture of Richard Allen. And one should not be surprised that black people in Philadelphia or Boston or New York or, 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 or Cleveland would be celebrating uh, Tucson literature. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's too often overlooked is that in the antebellum period, African Americans uh, eschewed the 4th of July, celebrating the 4th of July. They, they celebrated instead August the 1st, the date when uh, the British Empire abolished slavery in the British possessions. That was Black People's Independence Day. They called, they called it West India Emancipation Day. And whether you were in Philadelphia or in Indiana or in Canada, that was the day you celebrated. So you celebrate West India Emancipation Day, you celebrate Tucson Lupiture, you celebrate Richard Allen. This is not a United States phenomenon, it's not a Haiti phenomenon, it's a black Atlantic phenomenon. Protestantismo en Dominicana por George A. Lockwood, Monseñor Richard Allen, primer negro consagrado con ese rango sacerdotal cuya influencia y prestigio fueron el factor decisivo que hizo posible la emigración de los estadounidenses de sangre africana que vinieron a la isla en 1824 y 1825. Como todos sabemos, nosotros éramos una colonia española y luego fuimos colonia francesa. Y todo el proceso de superación de la situación colonial del pueblo dominicano se inició en contacto con los haitianos. Quiere decir que nosotros salimos del colonialismo con el proyecto de unificación de la isla de Jean-Pierre Boyer. En consecuencia, la primera vez que los dominicanos fuimos ciudadanos fue con esa unificación política. O sea que lo primero que fuimos ciudadanos haitianos antes de ser ciudadanos dominicanos. 
De manera que las ideas de libertad, de abolición de la esclavitud, de anticolonialismo, etc., nosotros la tomamos principalmente de ese periodo. Quiere decir que ese ambiente fue muy positivo para avanzar en la toma de conciencia de estos temas universales. Ya voy a hereda, digamos, de lo que fue el proceso revolucionario, porque no fue el gran dirigente revolucionario, lo fue de Salinas, lo fue Cristóbal, Petión, pero él eh, heredó ya ese proceso, de modo que él lo que hace es eh, extender lo que era la idea de los padres fundadores de la nación haitiana, ¿verdad? Y era que todo hombre negro pudiera alcanzar la libertad en su territorio. De manera que cuando se da la posibilidad de que él pueda invitar a esos negros norteamericanos libertos a venir a sentarse en el territorio para que ganaran su libertad, eso fue un gesto eh, de solidaridad muy importante. Pero además fue un gesto que enaltece la condición de estadista de este personaje que es Jean-Pierre Boyer, porque él entendía como una forma de poner en práctica lo que teóricamente se venía hablando desde el inicio de la revolución. Uh, I always thought that the Haitian Revolution uh, was not a local uh, event, it was uh, a transnational event, it was an international event. And uh, some of the concepts that came out of that were uh, uh, for the emancipation of a particular race in regard to the philosophy of slavery that insisted on making black second citizen. Uh, now, Uh, Prince Sanders, what was interesting to me was that uh, he came from either Philadelphia or Boston at that time. He is a graduate of one of the first colleges in the United States. Uh, he chose to become practically the Minister of Education of Henry Christophe. And he was, I would say, the architect of the migration of African Americans toward Haiti for fundamentally two reasons. One, Uh, he knew that uh, the slave state in the United States would continue to promote slavery. And second, he was also aware of the fact that there was a shortage of population uh, in Haiti to uh, guarantee the, the, the independence of that newly black country. So, uh, he perpetrated the policy that was started by Desalines, which in fact uh, wanted to pay Uh, uh, boat captain for any black uh, person that they would be brought into Haiti and turn them into, into free men. Uh, but I believe that Sanders went, went further than that. He, he organized the uh, American community in certain places, if I'm not mistaken, I would say Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, a, a kind of a, the extension of the underground trail. Uh, whereby uh, the slave could move from southern states uh, into uh, the northern states and then from there on migrate toward, toward Haiti, where they would be given land and they would be given the opportunity to practice trade and most importantly to produce agriculture. Uh, that also was part of a particular concern that the Henry Christoph had, which was somehow that he felt that one should move toward English-speaking uh, society as opposed to French-speaking society. He, co he continued to maintain that any link to France will eventually lead to bringing the Haitians back into slavery. So that's why he established very early relationship with Wilberforce and Clarkson, two abolitionists from England, who, by the way, will be receiving a French centers later, I would say, about 18 1818, uh, Sanders would be kind of the ambassador of Haiti to, uh, to, these, uh, to these people. And so the link was made uh, between African Americans, uh, uh, Haiti's need for population, uh, and social promotion, and of course Sanders, who then was kind of the architect of that particular movement. From there on, there was very early the concept Uh, of extending the revolution. And uh, Toussaint decided not to extend the revolution to the British islands. That's one aspect of the question. 
The second aspect of the question, very early, uh, the leadership of AIDS understood that it was their claim to fame and their responsibility to extend the, the liberation uh, of slaves toward Latin America. And that's where you, then you find uh, Dessalines and uh, Pétion supporting Miranda and Bolivar for the liberation of uh, Latin American countries such as the Greater Colombia, including Venezuela. Before they, were, they had got their freedom, went to Haiti, came on boats and they would settle there, and they had like, this farm. And he said, but people like these, I'd make a great nation. So that's why he contacted the American people, because he knew that there were people that would like liberty, but wanted to do something great for themselves and for the community where they live. Estas partes de, de la recepción, del acogimiento de los negros que o que no habían todo, que estaban todavía conociendo la esclavitud o que sufrían de prejuicios raciales también, como en Estados Unidos y en todas partes en el Caribe, yo creo que fue una constante durante todo el siglo XIX de los haitianos, porque hubo dos, incluso de Estados Unidos, hubo dos olas de inmigración, uno, eh, digamos, eh, de 24 hasta 35, y la otra durante, eh, digamos, más bien hacia el fin del siglo, hacia los años 60, y etc. Así que, uno ve que Haití en ese sentido fue una tierra de acogimiento, y de recepción de gentes bajo no solamente una solidaridad racial, es cierto, pero va más allá de la solidaridad, sino de la solidaridad con los oprimidos. African-American liberating themselves from, from uh, the white churches that were in some ways oppressing them. That was also parallel to the same, uh, to the, to that, to that same type of movement, first done by the French in their, in their home, well, by the Americans here, the French Revolution, and then the Haitian Revolution in 17, 1791, and then Richard Allen. Uh, so they were similar. So we identify with a similar, a similar type of liberation. It wasn't necessarily a physical liberation, but Richard Allen led a spiritual um, liberation that was as important. African Americans were very, very much aware, and so were white Americans, were very, very much aware of the Haitian Revolution. And, and, and they frightened whites to death. That, that what happened in Haiti could also happen in the United States. But one of the things that, 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 that's too little documented is that African Americans, whether they had ever been to Haiti or not, and most had not, they constantly talked about Toussaint Louverture 
As a matter of fact, in the late 19th century, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, Blackstone only talked about African-American heroes like Frederick Douglass and, and Richard Allen and Christmas Addis. Blacks were very, very much aware of who Toussaint Louverture was, and, and, and more recently, from the vantage point of the 19th century, another person emerged as a hero, Antonio Maceo. And so you would see in black, in sundry black populations, references, we must fight for our freedom, like Toussaint, like Antonio Maceo, and so forth. Blacks did not draw these distinctions between, well, these persons are from Haiti, these persons are from Cuba, these persons are from the United States. No, they were all part of the same Black Atlantic. It's a Black Atlantic world consciousness. It's in, in the it's in the very DNA of African Methodism. How well the how good the school stewardship of that concept has been over the years is another subject. But but that's that's what the AME Church was originally. That's its DNA. That's what it was. That's how it was originally conceptualized and envisaged. In 1896, he led the movement, along with M. M. Makone, to bring into the AME Church uh, the Ethiopian Church, which had been established in South Africa in 1892. And Henry Turner is best known in the AME Church and outside of the AME Church for having done that. Very few are aware, no one is aware, that, that during this same period of time, when Henry Turner was the Bishop of Georgia. He was the Bishop of Georgia from 1896 to 1908. While he was the Bishop of Georgia, he sent ministers out of Georgia into Cuba and Mexico and established AME churches in both of those places. We think, we think about Turner as associated with Africa. We don't think about Turner and his association with Cuba and Mexico. Uh, Turner, he connects the dots. It's not just the United States and Africa, it's the United States, Africa, and the Caribbean. That's the, that's the Richard Allen Black Atlantic consciousness. As the first woman president of the lay organization, I am really proud. Um, I am humbled by the support that I get from the members of the organization as well as from the clergy and the bishop. I was born in AME. My grandparents were AMEs. My parents are AMEs, so I was baptized in the AME church, confirmed. I um, got married in the AME church, and it's the only church I know. No, I love the AME church. Um, it's a church where you really grow, not only as a person, but you grow spiritually, and you learn so many different things you wouldn't learn elsewhere. Like, for instance, just to mention, um, our parliamentary procedure that we use for meetings is based on the Roberts Rules of Order, and that is the highest authority for meetings. Even in Parliament, they use that. So the Amy Church ta taught me how to conduct meetings um, about the Roberts Rules of Order parliamentary procedure. So I don't think you get that elsewhere in the world in other churches. The AME Church has quite a loaded and rich history and it stems from a time where white people and black people, although serving in the church together, they were not allowed to be at the altar at the same time. And um, obviously it was a time of oppression, of slavery, and our founder, Richard Allen, um, on a specific day where he had thought that the white people had finished praying, he went to the altar to also pray with a group of people. And because the whites had not finished praying, they were lifted, pulled up and told to go back because the whites were still praying. And on that day, he decided that he had enough of the oppression. And he took a bold step for all of us who are AMEs today by moving out of the Methodist Church and creating the African Methodist Episcopal Church for his own liberation, but I thank him that I can serve in a liberated church with so much history and, and so much compassion and, and bravery. Shame. If I were French, I'd say mercy, won't cool. 
distinguished black theologian uh, who's Presbyterian, Gayrod S. Wilmore, uh, said that the AME Church is the premier black denomination. That's a point of view shared by many who are aware of the denomination's historic significance. It's not a matter of hero worship, although some can interpret it that way. But when you when you when you line up Denmark VC and Rosa Parks and Oliver Brown after whom Brown versus Board of Education was named, uh, Vernon Jordan, when you when you line up persons like that and the list is of men and women is, is, is seemingly endless. You have to ask yourself the question, well, what is it about this particular religious body that produces such a disproportionate, not all of them, but such a disproportionate number of persons who've had an indispensably important role in the African American and Black Atlantic experience? And, uh, and so you have to then delve into what's the ethos of the denomination? What, what is it that distinguishes it from other religious bodies? And, I, and there you have to start with Richard Allen. I believe that's, that's the indispensable uh, first inquiry that one has to make. I mean, for, for a person who was a former, I mean, who was a slave, uh, and he was a slave up until the time that he was a grown man. He wasn't wasn't he was like he was a slave as a child and was manumitted while he was still in I mean he he was a man who lived in slavery up until the time that he was twenty three years old. So he knew what slavery was. He called it a bitter pill, even though he didn't have the most harsh of uh, of slave masters, but he said he was a slave nonetheless. Um, in eighteen eighteen, a group a group of free blacks led by Morris Brown in Charleston heard about the AME Church in Philadelphia. And Morris Brown organized African Americans in, in Charleston into an AME, a very large AME congregation that had both slaves and free persons. One of the persons who joined that church was, the church of Charleston, was a person who was a former slave in the Danish West Indies who won the lottery and bought his freedom. His name was Denmark Vesey. And he became a local preacher in Morris Brown's AME Church. And in AME Church meetings, Denmark Vesey and another man by the name of Gullah Jack and a number of other African Americans in this AME congregation plotted a slave insurrection in Charleston. And uh, they would have pulled it off in 1822, except that someone divulged the plans. And, and Denmark, V.C., and Gala Jack, and a number of others were caught and hung. Morris Brown, who was the pastor of the church, he had to escape from Charleston to Philadelphia, where Richard Allen gave him refuge. And after that, Amy Church was, was disbanded. It was, it was outlawed in Charleston. And then Mark Vesey was hung and, and uh, others among his co-conspirators. So they were, going to, they were going to take up arms and overthrow slavery. We believe in what we do. We, it's part of our psyche, part of our, our struggle. And we, we speak to people who are struggling in whatever areas it is. It doesn't have to be racism at all. We believe our God is a, is, a, is a liberator from poverty, from ignorance. So we believe in education, you know? And, and we believe that, we believe that, that, that with God on our side, we can do, there's no limit to what we can do. And that message, people want to hear that. And that's why the church is going in India. India got one of the interesting systems in the world. You know that. Caste system, you know. And our message speaks to them that, that all men are created equal. We, we by the way, I, I left a whole paragraph. We change, not only America, we change the world. We redefine what happened 
If we had, when we got there on the 18th that morning, if we had said, no, we're not having a service. This is enough. We would have burned down Johnson. Billions of dollars. But we chose not to. We chose to respond hit with love. And, and for me, that's the central theme of the AME Church. Not, not guns, but love. I mean, that inaugurates a fascinating discussion, which the church has never really grappled with uh, in, a, in a theological way. Uh, this whole notion, uh, as you said, uh, when, when I mentioned Denmark VC, I mean, really, it, it really stunned me. That uh, you mean he's going to take up arms, and of course, you know, but yeah, the fact that I raised his, his name indicated yes, of course, if he had been given the chance, it's just that they, his his plans were betrayed before he had a chance to do it. And these ladies who formed in 1874 the Women's Parent Mike Missionary Society, who say that their two heroes are Richard Allen and Tucson Louverture, well, they were well, Tucson Louverture was not, was he was not. He wasn't passing out marshmallows. I mean, he he, he took up arms successfully through uh, successfully so and overthrew by force by force of arms. The French they knew what they were saying. That's how that's how they defined it. That that a black theology of liberation, according to their definition, includes taking arms to establish freedom. And, and there really hasn't been an honest discussion, especially since the Civil Rights Movement, because the AV Church bought into the nonviolent, the, the, the tactic of nonviolence, but but has never really come to grips with reconciling nonviolence and its espousal of nonviolence with this what they would call proud history of participating in the violent overthrow of slavery. And they all, to the person, said that participating in the Civil War, that was a good thing. No apologies for it. Enrico Vidboy, it was, he came to the General Conference to get an award. <laughs> I mean, they were celebrating him as, as uh, this is the descendant of Richard Allen. I think it's one of the, uh, the African Methodist Church, African Methodist Episcopal Churches. Church is one of the churches in Namibia who who was playing an important role to liberate this country. Our pastors, that time, before independence, before 1990, before 1990, they, uh, they, uh, they used the platforms of the church, for example. For example, the pulpits and whatever platforms to, to motivate our people to, to to take part in, in politics so that we can liberate the, the country. So our church played, played uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church played a very important role in liberating this 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 country. Our our people was was uh, our leaders was in jail. Our pastors, for example, I can mention the late uh, uh, Captain Reverend Hendrik Wetpui. He was jailed and tortured. The Reverend Carrera, the church where you were yesterday, you saw the tombstone, the name there. He was also declared as a hero. And then we have Reverend Cheremuyen. And then many of our people, of our leaders, really they, they motivate, they took part in fighting for the liberation of this country. So therefore, our church, the African Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, is a I'll stay in church. Uh, the Gendry Gendry Bhattwai said that uh, uh, to the uh, German emperors that time, that uh, the Lord 
had created all of us as equals on this world. And God has put you there on your part of the world to govern yourselves. And God has also put me here to govern over my territory and over myself. Yeah. So uh, you can expect me to subject myself under a foreign rule. Yeah. So now that was actually uh, the bone of contention uh, to the German uh, imperials that time and then uh, that uh, they didn't want to hear that. They regard that as a stubbornness uh, from the old man uh, and that he um, organized the, the, the African leaders and told them that, uh, no, we can't be ruled by someone else uh, whilst a court had created us on an equal footing uh, so that uh, I am the uh, king of my people, the heroes are the king of their people, the Germans are the rulers over their people, so they can come and then claim that uh, this part of the world where they found us belong to them and that they suppress us and then want us to subject ourselves under the rule. The name Witboy, Witboy, means a lot to Namibia, according to me. Because Hendrik Witboy, our leader, was one of the outstanding leaders in Namibia, who took up the gun and fought for this country to liberate this country. He was one of them. That, that, that's why uh, uh, the, 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 you cannot separate Big Boy from Namibia. So therefore, I should say that uh, as, as his followers, followers he's his grandson, okay, his sons, 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 grand, yeah, great grandson, uh, Hendrik Wadboy, who recently passed on 2009. He was also an outstanding leader, uh, not uh, taking, uh, leaving out the other ones. But he can, if I can mention his name, he was also an outstanding leader, recognized by the Namibian government as a hero. He was also a pastor of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, he was also a captain of, of the clan. So therefore I said, it's just like the word voices, they have the Bible, they have the Bible in the one hand and the gun in the other hand. They are involved in politics, they are involved in the, in the, in the church, like me. For me, it was uh, because I was not aware of, 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 of those uh, uh, that, that memorial raised on there. Uh, I was surprised when I came there and heard that uh, uh, there was there was actually a grave of our people who's been killed by the by the uh, uh, Germans those days, and I was very shocked. Uh, I got uh, actually emotional when I when I got there and just think just to be think that these people are our black people who's been killed by by the by the Germans so uh, I was I was very emotional and, and, and I was not aware of, of, of that stone I think most of, 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 of the history of our uh, our country was kept behind for, for uh, away from us I don't know for what reason but I that, that's my that's my thought that uh, there's some history that uh, our children didn't know about it. And of some of us, I'm 42 years old now, and there's some of things that I didn't know. So I think that, this, uh, that was kept uh, behind, and uh, we are not able to, to that uh, we must know the things. The Herero Nama genocide is a very, very sensitive issue. As we, uh, as Nama still, struggling with the Germans uh, to, 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 to pay back what they did to us because they killed our, our, our parents and great parents 
and then we are very emotional about uh, about that issue. And and I, I think uh, if they could, they, there's nothing they they can do to repay us because they uh, left a big big. Uh, how can I say? It's a it's a it's a painful situation for us, and they leave a big pain in our heart. When you read the literature at that time, then it was so cruel to see that, uh, uh, for instance, a man has been killed, decapitated, and then perhaps it was his wife or sister or mother that was given that uh, head to skin it with uh, pieces of broken glass to skin it and then the, 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 the skin were put in separate cases then again to cut the skull open and then to remove the brain then it was now put in a separate container then to be transported to Germany for examination just to see that um, they regard themselves as superiors over the African people, over the black-skinned people. So that's why I say that uh, one can forgive the German uh, people who have been doing these atrocities, but one can't never forget it. That history and, and the history of, of, uh, of AMEs were intimately involved with the African National Congress, with Nelson Mandela. I mean, you know, before and after Sharpville. One of the things I, re I, I remember um, when I was in college, I remember uh, a number of, I, I, went, I went to college with, with, with students from South Africa and from the old Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Right? And in fact, one, one, one of my classmates, Derek Thompson, I remember, asking him about what he thought about Ian Smith. And he said, I'll do everything, I'm paraphrasing, everything I can to overthrow the minority white regime. And he did go back after graduation. He was killed in the, in the fight against the white minority rule in, in, in Rhodesia. Most African Americans remember very vividly um, the bombing of, uh, of the 16th Street Baptist Church and the four little girls who were killed. Uh, but just as poignant as that among the students at my college was the Sharpeville Massacre in 1960. Just like but Birmingham was a defining moment for blacks in the United States, Sharpeville was for blacks in South Africa. And we learned about it. And, 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 for, and for us, Sharpeville and Birmingham, they were one of the same. And, and their AMEs involved in all of that. But we've never had a denomination-wide discourse in a theological context. The history's there, so that's not debatable. That's not disputable. You don't have to argue about, is there history? Of course. Uh, I remember seeing in the Christian Recorder um, a, an account by Alexander W. Wayman, who was elected a bishop in 1864, about uh, uh, half of the, the class leaders of Bethel Church in Baltimore marched off into the Union Army and how proud he was to see those soldiers marching out of old Bethel Church into the summer to fight. I mean, I mean they, you know, they, they weren't, as I said, they weren't fighting with marshmallows. They were fighting with, with guns and books. That was celebrated. That's the AME heritage. And so how do you, how do you, bring, how do you bring all of that together with nonviolence, what is it that makes it theologically permissible, in one context, uh, to take up arms and not to do so in another context? I'm a nonviolent person, but I have to grapple with that history of which I too am proud. That when, when given the opportunity to overthrow slavery, uh, we weren't going to let that opportunity pass. And it wasn't going to pass while well, we were debating whether we should take up arms or not. There was no debate. There was no debate and no dissent. If you, you look at the pages of the Christian Reporter, you will see there is no dissent. 
The only impatience was, why is it taking President Lincoln so long to say that this is a fight against slavery and not to preserve the Union? the group was Bishop Richard Allen, the first bishop of the, of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He organized the groups and sent them. Group by group, they came down. But he told them that, remember that they couldn't load the boats too much. According to their train, they brought along with them what to keep on, keep up their train. My grand grandfather, he was a shipbuilder, so you know those tools were very heavy. When they was coming from down south, he met this boy and he asked him in the road sitting, and he said, what are you doing there? He said, my grandfather's bringing me on his shoulder. And I dropped off and he kept on running. He said, well, you come along with me. Me en la iglesia metodista episcopal africana, africana metodista episcopal, que por eso son las siglas AMI, porque en inglés, ante todo en inglés, AMI, A.M.E. Y de ahí que viene AMI, porque ante todo, todo era en inglés, y por eso se pronuncia AMI. Yo he corregido muchas personas aquí en Samana, gente, personas cultas, pero no saben, y dicen es mí. Digo yo, no, no es Smith, porque Smith es un apellido de aquí de Samana, con S, y termina en PH, pero aquí es Smith, porque es inglés las siglas, AME, se pronunciaba todo en inglés y ha seguido con Amy, Amy, y aquí hay una mezcla eh, fuertísima, sí. 
con mi iglesia en africano y mi iglesia en mí, yo la adoro, yo la quiero. Y el, el calor eh, amoroso de, de, de nosotros, de, de nuestros ancestros, lo vivimos siempre. Usted vio como cantó Tina Miller. Eso es una cosa preciosa. Yo vivo eso, yo me emociono. The Amy Church is trying to achieve its Black Atlantic objectives uh, has been imperfect because when, 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 you, when you engage in an ambitious project of trying to unite persons of African descent in a global context, you're, you're confronting a whole host of of ethnic and linguistic and cultural challenges. Not all persons of African descent are alike. Some speak English, some speak Spanish, some speak French, some speak Portuguese. Need we go into the multitude of African languages which are spoken? and are represented in the church and, and are part of the church's ambition. I remember reading something about Sierra Leone and, and, and the person writing was talking about the great success they had in Freetown. And they were just getting out 40, 50, 60 miles outside of Freetown into the hinterland where the, where the success was a lot more mixed. Not only were they confronted uh, native religions native languages, but also Muslims as well. So it, it, it really, it's one thing to articulate a Black Atlantic vision. It's a lot harder to realize it when you consider that, that um, you have pre, a Creole denomination trying to interact with a whole host of indigenous peoples. So I just want, I wanted, I wanted that to, I mean, that, that's a part of this AME narrative, too. Of course, we, we congratulate the institution over time for making the attempt, because it, it, it's a hard, it, it, it's, it's, it's a hard uh, thing to achieve, and, and, and kudos to them for, for making the attempt. But the success has been uneven. Mother Bethel, um, to some people, is a church. To other people, it's a museum. Uh, still, to other people, it's an archive. Uh, and then I guess some would simply say that it's a story. And I'd have to say that it's all of those things. Uh, it has been an active worshiping congregation since 1794 on a parcel of land purchased by Richard Allen in 1791. Uh, it's the oldest piece of land owned by African Americans. Uh, but that does not tell the entire story. Uh, what began on this corner on 6th and Lombard in Philadelphia in the 1790s uh, is now on five continents and in 40 different countries uh, where AMEs worship uh, under the banner of African Methodism. It all started here. I've been the pastor here now going on six years, and I have to say honestly that it is uh, still almost like a dream. Uh, it doesn't seem real. Uh, as an AME pastor, you know, I've always held Mother Bethel in such high regard. Uh, it's almost been a mythical institution. Uh, I was not born and raised in this area. I was born and raised in California. And so I remember in 2000, my first visit to Philadelphia, uh, finding my way to Mother Bethel. I didn't even need to ask directions. I just simply told people I was looking for 6th and Lombard. And I was downtown, and they kind of directed me in the direction of the church. So to stand here, you know, in 2000 and look at this building, uh, it was just an incredible experience. And then to come back eight years later as the pastor was just absolutely unbelievable. Um, every Sunday still feels like it's, you know, not necessarily real. And uh, it's just been a great experience. Really, when I learned about Richard Allen, I did not learn in school at all. I learned more as an adult. So my education as far as African people and our contributions here was was not in existence. So. so, and that's the reason why I think it's important that our children learn about that uh, because the public education school that I attended in Tennessee did not provide that type of information in the textbooks. Yes, it's very important that our children are here today. 
Um, we home educate our children. And so as their educators, we think that them understanding the significance of um, African people here in America, that it's important for us to understand our past. And because they're able to understand their past, um, they're able to have a better connection as their responsibilities as far as African people here in the United States, why they should continue to carry the torch of, you know, of our um, forefathers um, in order to make their situation for all African people in the diaspora better. Estoy lista para cualquier pregunta. ¿Se mantiene el movimiento en Samaná o ha ejercido la vida? Bueno, en, la, en lo que hay allá es una comunidad. Eh, justamente una de las ambiciones de mi investigación y de este trabajo es eh, documentar antes de que de transicione esta a generación que todavía está hablando el inglés eh, como primer idioma. Eh, por ejemplo, salió ahí el señor Jesse Miller, la señora que cantó, Tina Miller, su marido, que eh, se murió. Eh, Martha Wilmore es la historiógrafa, eh, qué sé yo, legendaria de la iglesia. Ya está, entre comillas, retirada, no tiene sucesora. Como vieron también los papeles eh, de... de de los registros de, de la iglesia están muy deteriorados. Estuve hace un par de días con el señor Roberto Casar, eh, que me recibió y, y se motivó a, a rescatar esas, esos trabajos, esos eh, registros que, que están muy deteriorados. Es decir, el inglés como identificador, como factor identificador de la comunidad, eh, sí ha desaparecido. Eh, las generaciones, eh, digamos la nieta de la, señora, de la señora Wilmore no habla inglés y justamente están tratando de rescatar eh, el inglés porque con el desarrollo de, del turismo pues es, es eh, también para ellos, no solamente por una cuestión familiar sino también económica. 
eh, pero es una iglesia, es una congregación con una identidad sí muy, muy, muy compacta eh, que ya tiene características distintas eh, ahora generacionalmente, por supuesto. Judy Anderson también. Judy Anderson habló. Sí. sí. Su amiga, ¿y usted sí. fue la que dijo que ella es su amiga? Eso es mi amiga, sí. Ah, genial. Ella es fantástica. Eh, se supone que Judy va a tomar el rol de, la, de ser historiógrafa. Eh, pero se ha enfermado bastante, lamentablemente. Y buenas noches. Yo te felicito porque es un documental enriquecedor, muy eh, ilustrativo. Eh, se me ocurre, no por capricho, sino por eh, coincidencia de apellidos de origen isleño inglés en San Pedro de Macorís, que no se mencionó porque tu trabajo versa más sobre esa manera y esos eh, inmigrantes ingleses pero el fenómeno de San Pedro y un poquito la romana eh, no es muy di distante de lo que sucedió con las inmigraciones inglesas isleñas y continentales que han llegado a nuestro país en contraste a algún vínculo, aunque no lo expusieras en el excelente documental. Sí, sí, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, ustedes los historiadores saben y las historiadoras eh, que hay que delimitar los periodos que uno investiga. Eh, yo me limité a, esa, a, esa, a ese, ese momento, 1824-26 justamente porque entre otras agendas discursivas tengo la de resemantizar la historiografía canónica sobre la revolución haitiana y su papel en la formación de nuestras identidades múltiples que tenemos. Eh, habemos tres personas que hemos, eh, o sea, digamos en este, en este momento, en eh, los últimos siete años, eh, que hemos desarrollado tesis doctorales sobre la Iglesia Africana Metodista Episcopal, la Academia Dominicana de la Historia, como bien mencionó eh, Frank Moya Pons, acaba eh, de editar pues, este año ¿no? la traducción de Denis Hidalgo, que es uno de ellos, que escribió eh, haciendo un, una especie de, de mapa emocional de estos eh, misioneros, Cardi, Tyndall y Dewey, eh, que no era misionero, pero era parte de esta iniciativa de traer los años aquí. Eh, Cristina Davidson que acaba de terminar en Duke University y ella justamente eh, está tratando eh, la Iglesia Africana Metodista Episcopal en San Pedro de Macorís en el Este, ¿no? en las Romanas y eh, la migración que vino a raíz de la, del boom de la industria cañera en esa época eh, y yo que estoy tratando de terminar de escribir, ya lo lograré bien pronto bueno, muy buenas noches. Eh, yo quisiera saber, se dijo en el fin que nosotros habíamos sido colonizados por los españoles y luego por los franceses, pero también fuimos dominados por los haitianos por unos años. Eh, entonces, yo quisiera saber en ese sentido, eh, a pesar de que no me considero, no considero todavía globalmente al mundo, a los hombres libres, ¿No se considera como? A los hombres libres todavía. Se ha avanzado mucho, pero no considero eh, que somos libres totalmente. Ahora bien, me gustaría saber de qué será lo próximo que nos liberaremos, tanto los haitianos, los negros, los pobres, eh, en esta sociedad. Me gustaría saber. Ah, pero espérese, yo solo soy realizadora, yo no soy profeta. <risa> Yo soy una mujer muy ambiciosa, pero mire, no tanto, ¿no? Eh, yo sí le puedo decir que, eh, lo, que lo que dice eh, la última secuencia, la madre de esos eh, dos niños, eh, sobre la, la importancia que tiene conocer el pasado para conocerse uno mejor, eh, eso forma parte de un proceso de colonización mental, cuando uno acumula cierta eh, cantidad de datos históricos que han estado, verdad, sumergidos. Eh, es un proceso eh, que, que machado, caminante, no hay camino, etc. Sí. La última pregunta, entonces, la voy a decir. 
afroamericano y no me, no me recordaba ni, ni a la tasia, porque yo estaba solita estaba como un poco miedosa qué sé yo hasta que dije ay hoy Musi Musi Anastasia sí a por se hace ah oh ay, ay. bueno me monté en mi guagua y fui al lugar muy bien le di la gracia llegué al lugar y para mí fue algo caramba Dios mío que no he podido olvidar Señores, ustedes saben lo que es yo encontrar en ese museo. Es una gran experiencia. Eh, esto, eh, eh, ¿cómo le dicen? Anafe, que se usaba aquí en nuestro país. Los dos tipos de anafe en ese museo. Y las sábanas, que yo llegué a ver en la familia de mi mamá en el Cibao, que se usaban de esa, de, 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 de tela, de retazo exactamente. Eso lo vi yo en ese museo. Eso me hizo a mí acercarme más y saber que todo, todos nosotros, digo los, los dominicanos, venimos de África. ¿verdad? Hay una gran herencia. Y lo que me extrañaba es que cómo ellos se identifican. Museo afroamericano. Afroamericano. Anastasia pero fue una gran experiencia y si eres volver yo vuelvo otra vez a ir a visitar a ese gran museo muchísimas gracias no, no, en Washington está como de aquí a la romana eso fue lo que me extrañó de que estuviera, que está en Washington Nacol, yo te di la gracia sí Gracias, y escúcheme. No, a ti, Nacol, yo te di la gracia. Yo le di la gracia a Nacol. Nacol, por favor, levántate. Señor, un aplauso para Nacol. Él es mi productor de campo. Muchas gracias, Nacol, por traer a tu familia. Gracias a ti, dice esta película, de verdad. Perdón, que, que yo, los agradecimientos siempre se me olvidan. ¿no? Permítanme invitarle a las próximas actividades de la Academia. El miércoles 18, la puesta en circulación del libro Los Cimientos del Despotismo, Los Campesinos, el Régimen de Trujillo y la Modernidad en la Historia Dominicana del doctor Richard Tourist, profesor asociado del Departamento de Historia, Estudios Africanos y Latinoamericanos, 
de la Universidad William Mary en Williamsburg, Virginia, miembro correspondiente extranjero de esta academia que será presentado por Framo Yamón de nuevo. El miércoles 25, la conferencia La Matanza de Haitianos de 1937 por el licenciado Rafael Darío Herrera, miembro correspondiente de la Academia Dominicana de la Historia. Y permítanme recordarles a todos que en pocos días estaremos celebrando el duodécimo Congreso Nacional de Historia que tendrá su sede física en la Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra en el recinto de Santo Domingo al cual están todos invitados. Muchas gracias por su asistencia y vamos al tradicional brindis después del festival.